Now you can deal with it. He's back. All right. Good morning, doers of the word. Good morning. We're coming to you this morning from Doers of the Word Baptist Church. And you're listening to us this morning on the voice of Liberty. That is Liberty Works Radio Network, 104.3 FM, The Eagle in Tampa and Ocala. I'm Pastor Ernie Sanders, and the title of the message this morning is Christian Liberty for the Church. Now, how many times have you heard people say, you shouldn't eat that? Well, that's selfish. That's shellfish. You can't eat shellfish. Or, uh, you shouldn't eat that. Well, that's pork, okay? Uh, it, it's against the dietary laws. Well, in effect, what you ought to do is just do like I do. You just uh, you ought to just get yourself one great, big, healthy 16-ounce porterhouse Steak, bloody rare. Well, folks, let's turn. We're going to start this morning in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. The verse is very familiar to all of you. And that is this. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee, and thou hast, thou shalt be no priest to me. See, and thou hast forgotten the law of God. I will also forget thy children. Now, here they reject the knowledge that's already been given to them. That's what he's referring to. And they forgo the priesthood, meaning there's no salvation. You see, we are all to be a nation of priests. The office of the priesthood into the Calvary, when, when the veil of the temple rent after Jesus said, it is finished, the office of the priesthood ended there. From that point on, as Peter says, we became a nation, a royal of priests. Up until that time, you had to take your sacrifice to a priest and and have the priest offer it up. But now, we have one priest, one intercessor between us and, the, and God, and that's Christ Jesus. So we go directly to the Father. There is no more veil. There is no more wall. Now, he goes on to say here, And I will reject thee, and thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. Folks, our children, our poor children in this country today, we've seen what has happened to them. And uh, here he's talking about they're making their children pay an awful, awful price because they rejected, they didn't hear. But now for those that do hear and those that pay attention, if you turn to Mark chapter 2, or Mark... <coughs> Take that Mark 4, 21 through 25, Mark chapter 4, 21 through 25. And he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed, and not to be set on a candlestick? But there is nothing hid that shall not be manifested, neither was there anything kept secret, but that it should be should come abroad. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, Take heed what you hear, with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. For he that hath, to him shall be given. And he that hath not from him shall be taken away that which he has. So to hear means to understand and to apply. And uh, those that reject the word, well, they'll, they'll soon forget what little understanding of Scripture that 
and little knowledge they had already. And so, and again, all of that knowledge that they've rejected is right there in the Word of God. I want you to go now over here to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, during the Middle Ages especially, uh, there was a false teaching, and not just the, by the Catholic Church. It was the period of, during the Middle Ages that uh, many, many of the uh, clergy taught that the one is more spiritual if he abstains from natural monogamous marriage. And of course we know what that has done. The Bible makes it very clear that a pastor is to be the husband of one wife. In other words, a major part of a pastor's ministry is to counsel people, to counsel families, to counsel marriage. And it's very, very hard to do if you've never been married, if you don't, if you've never been in a relationship. So what, what came out of all of that? Well, I don't have to tell you today, uh, especially in the Catholic Church, there's a major, major problem there with homosexuality and pedophilia. But not just in the Catholic Church, in the world, the National Council of Churches and liberalism, it's a growing, growing problem today. And so we read here, starting in verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the later times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, he makes two points. One, the later times. He does not say end times. He says later times because this started early in the sixth dispensation period. That This started up very early. And so the, the, uh, what he's talking about, and especially during the middle of the church age, uh, this became very, very more and more prevalent. And so he's talking about seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Doctrines of devils. Um, and here the doctrine of these devils are meant to make Christians think that uh, we are under bondage of these doctrines. For example, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a white hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created, to receive with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving for it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer and of course you know that uh, a lot of that again even today is being taught by Gnostics and a lot of your pagans uh, you have a major movement out there Pete and others uh, not to eat meat okay well you know they, they have uh, some grounds for when they talk about, and I think we're all in favor of that, it's an interesting thing. You notice how, I don't know one single pro-lifer, anyone who's in, in favor of, of rescuing children uh, that, uh, that are in favor of um, mistreating animals. You know, when you raise, I won't eat veal. Now the reason I don't eat veal is because I don't like the way that these veal calves are raised. I don't think it's humane. So I won't eat veal. Okay. Uh, and so that too within God's word, the Bible is very, very clear for those that mistreat animals. You know, that is a transgression against God's property. And so, but here there are those that teach that uh, you've got to abstain from meat altogether. And that is not what God's word, the Bible. Some say, well, you have to abstain from only certain meats. These are doctrines of devils doctrines of men, as the scripture tells you. Now, uh, <clears throat> and the idea is to make, to make people think that they're under the bondage of dietary laws. And here's the point. The point was, they were never given to us in the first place. At the same time, as old Forrest Gump says, stupid is as stupid does. Uh, let's take a look at that. We have a fellow... <laughs> Another fellow at the other church. And he has the best of he, the best of intentions. He has the best of intentions, uh, but he continuously going after people, telling them that you shouldn't eat that, you shouldn't touch this. And we have a lady out there that's a, it's a very very nice lady. She's got a lot of health issues, a whole lot of health issues. And every time this guy gets around her, she starts crying. 
is basically telling her everything that uh, she's doing is the cause of all of her problems. Okay? And so let's turn over to Genesis chapter 9. And in Genesis chapter 9, we're going to let the Word of God sort it out. And we start... Starting in verse 3. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. You understand? Every now here's what God says. Now this is some people are gonna say, Well, that's the old testament, Pastor. That's that's meant for Israel. No, there was no Israel at this time. There was no nation of Israel at this time. Right. This is a covenant, it's a Noah covenant. And this covenant expands every dispensation period. He makes it very clear. He literally spells that out for you. Okay? And he says this, But flesh for the life thereof, which is the blood, therefore shall you not eat. Amen. He's telling you that if you eat a steak that's bloody, uh, folks, that's a sin. Exactly. He's, he's telling you very clearly not to do it, you see. Mm -hmm. So you shouldn't eat rare meat. Number one, it's not very good for you at all. Okay? Now, anytime you get into a disagreement with God, you're going to lose that disagreement. You can have as many opinions you want and believe whatever you want, but you're going to lose your disagreement. And today, people out there, they, they eat a rare steak, and boy, that thing's got every kind of drug in it you can imagine. Uh, those old cows were given all kinds of hormones, growth hormones, and you just about name it. And people walk around, and a lot of them come down with cancer uh, because of that. Why? Well, they're not, they're not obeying the Word of God. He's telling them, here, look, anything that moves, I'm giving you, but don't eat the blood. Don't eat the blood. Right. People don't want to listen. Amen? Well, as surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast, will I require at the hand of the man. At the end of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man, shall his blood be shed. <coughs> For in the image of God made he man. And you be fruitful and multiply and bring forth abundantly in the earth and to multiply there. Therefore, that's where we get the statute of the death penalty. And the idea, if you take an innocent life, that, see, God gave man in all of the environment. And verses 1 through 4. He gave men dominion over the environment. He kept dominion of man for himself. So when you, again, uh, destroy an innocent life, well, then you need to forfeit your own. Mm -hmm. And the problem we have today is we don't have, in order to do that, to carry out the death penalty, you have to have statute and standing with the Word of God. In other words, you have to be legitimate. And our government has lost its legitimacy. It's lost its legitimacy. That court, as I always tell you, in Washington, D.C., uh, they have no standing. They have no, they've lost all of their, they may have power, but they've got no authority. Well, he goes on and he says this in verse 9. And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, with the fowl of the cattle, of the, every beast of the earth, with you from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth, and I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by waters of the flood, neither shall there be more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I made between me and you, and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. So what is he telling you? He's telling you this is for perpetual generations. And then uh, I want to jump ahead to verse 15. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow, the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. So God made this covenant to span all dispensation periods. It's an everlasting covenant. And in that everlasting covenant, he makes very clear. Look, 
that God has given us all of the animals, everything that moves upon the earth uh, for meat. He just he gives you some very, very clear specifications. Now, uh, I want to go over to Romans chapter 14. Now, when it comes to holy days, or where it comes to new moons, or even to birthdays, or Sunday worship, we often hear the loud grunts of the contentious Judaizers. We've had people, uh, we've had people actually leave this church because we sing happy birthday to one another. We had have, we have folks that used to attend this church and they left because they didn't want us singing happy birthday. Okay. <clears throat> I think it was Kevin that did it. <laughs> but but we're going to take a, let's take a fast look at this now. Uh, Kevin and I got together and uh, we did some study on the new moons and the first moons and all of that and the, the holy days. And uh, we came to this collusion. <laughs> and I didn't misspeak. According to this year's calendar, the first day of Nisan is sundown. On April 9th, the new moon, Rosh, means day. Kodesh means literally head of the month. The 14th day of Nisan, the 22nd of April, at sundown, starts Passover. The next night, the 15th day of Nisan, April 23rd, starts the Feast of the Unleavened Bread for the next seven days. God commands to do no survival work on the first in the last days of unleavened bread. On the 16th day of Nisan, April 24th, is first fruits. First fruits, according to Leviticus 23, is the, the Sabbath within unleavened bread. God commanded the children of Israel, when they come into the land, they give an offering of the first fruits unto the priests. The calendar puts Good Friday on the day of the new moon, which should be Passover, which mathematically it doesn't work. So. The Hebrew calendar puts a leap month in this year, the second Adar. Now, if we take out the leap month, the second of Adar, and start Nisan in its place, Rosh Kadesh, literally, the head of the month is the new moon, April 9th. The full moon, which would be Passover, would be the 13th or 14th day of the Hebrew month. Unleavened bread would start the next night, March 25th. The Sabbath, or in our case, Sunday, within unleavened bread, would be Resurrection Sunday, which is its first fruits. Seventh Sabbath Sundays after first fruits, Resurrection Sunday would be Pentecost. Adding a leap month of two Adar doesn't make the math in Leviticus 23 add up. Taking the leap month out, the leap month out works. Passover at sundown Wednesday, March 23rd, Good Friday, and March 25th. Uh, Resurrection Sunday, March 27th. Well, you know, there's there's more to this, but uh, I, don't, I don't want you all falling asleep. <laughs> but anyhow, I did that for you, Dale. <laughs> so, so you would know. We, we looked into this very, very carefully. Now, I want to go to Romans chapter 14. And as we take a look at this, starting in verse 1, okay, him that, that is weak and have in the faith receive ye, but not the doubtful disputations. Now, doubtful disputation means to have critical judgment on inward reasonings of others. In other words, um, it's, you know, <clears throat> it's for us to take liberties that we shouldn't take because, you know, you can't, uh, when you take, a, a, you, you know, I can see what somebody does, <coughs> like uh, Friday night, um, when Dan was arguing with me. Okay, I can see he was out of place, but I'm not kidding. Uh, but I don't know why he was arguing with me. Okay, it might be he just didn't know any better. But anyhow, <laughs> going to say that puckers yell, but I say that. But anyhow, folks. And this verse swings two ways. Yeah, I know. So this, but this is what it means. It means when when you are trying to you think you understand why someone is doing something or. Uh, you decide that maybe they're not doing because that's not what you would do so therefore uh, it's the wrong thing. For one believes that he may eat all things, another who is weak and eateth herbs 
Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him that eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant to his own master? Be standing there falleth. Yes, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth unto the Lord. He that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth thanks. God thinks that uh, God thinks, and he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose, revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set up not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So let every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us therefore judge, therefore judge one another, and let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this, <coughs> that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion and to fall in his brother's way. I know, and I am persuaded by the Lord Jesus, that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. Let not your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat, and drink, but righteousness, and peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that is in these things serveth Christ, and is acceptable to God, and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroyeth not the work of God, all things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby they, thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to hide thyself, have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which is allowed. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Now, here, I said all that to say this in short. If God does not speak directly to the subject, uh, thou shalt or thou shalt not, then the matter shall be left up to the individual believer in accordance with <coughs> well, conscience and common sense. See, there's a lot of things the Bible doesn't speak directly to. And if it doesn't speak directly to that, then there's a little test that you can give it, and we'll, we'll look at that little test here. And let's do that. And, and by the way, there's something that a lot of people don't quite understand, you know, where it comes to, they're telling you, uh, you know, you've got to regard this day or you've got to regard that day. We are under liberty. We're not under the law. And God never gave uh, us the laws of Moses. He didn't give us. Okay. We are the church. We are not Israel. And uh, we see often uh, today we have uh, the Judaizers, we have the Gnostics, we have the pagans, all trying to inflict their own personal doctrines or dogmas upon us. And here if we go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 23, we read this. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. <coughs> no. So, when you come to a, a, a situation where it's not directly spoken of in Scripture, you, you have to ask yourself a couple questions. One, 
Uh, does this practice help you or hurt you? Is this something that's going to be helpful to you or is this something that's going to hurt you? Uh, does it help or hurt others? Okay. Does it build up people or does it tear down people? So you have to ask yourself those questions here. And then if you go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we start uh, in verse 12. Now all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the bondage of any. Now what does that mean? The bondage of anything uh, is that you are to avoid anything that's addictive. If it's alcohol, if it's cigarettes, uh, whatever it is, any kind of drugs, pornography, anything that places you under its bondage. Okay? Um, and you know, that, that's a lot of things that, that, that can do that. Okay? That can place you, um, you know, some people are under the bondage of those little smartphones. I mean, they're always there. You know, they cannot tear themselves away from somewhere under a television program. So they'll, uh, you know, the house can be on fire and they'll sit there and watch their favorite program because they're addicted to this stuff, okay? Um, it can get in a lot, a lot of areas it can cover. And so here he goes on, meats for the belly and belly for the meats. The guy shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but the Lord and the Lord for the body. Now, that's an interesting thing. Uh, when it comes to fornication, uh, if you go over to Leviticus chapter 20, you see, because when I say that word fornication, you all probably get a picture of one thing in your mind. But that covers, there's a lot of it, a lot of things that fall under that word fornication. If you go to Leviticus chapter 20 and read verses 10 through 21, you don't have to do it now, do it later you will see a number of the things that are clearly spelled out. This is fornication. This is very clearly spelled out for you. He goes on to say, And God hath both raised up the Lord and will raise us up by his own power. Know you not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make the members of Christ a harlot? God forbid. What know you not? That he which is joined to a harlot is one body, for two, saith, shall be one flesh. In other words, uh, whenever you're joined to a whore, you're, uh, you become one flesh with that whore. And this is one of the things when you have uh, these prostitutes, literally, uh, their sin, uh, every, they share the sin of every man that they're with. And so, you know, there's a lot of sins involved there, right? Anyhow, <laughs> but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And your spirit God's. Now folks, I want you to think about something. And your body doesn't belong to you. You understand? We don't belong to ourselves. This is what scripture clearly says in several places. So when you do these things with your body, what are you doing? You're transgressing the property of God. You understand? You're, you are doing that with the property of God. Now think about how you feel when somebody takes something that belongs to you and abuses it. And that's basically what you're doing. God's got a really long memory. A very, very long memory. Okay. And so, I want you to go over to Mark chapter 2. Now Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through 28. <clears throat> and it came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn and Pharisees said unto him behold 
Why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? And he said unto them, Have you never read what David did when he had need and was a hunger, he and they that were with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abathar, the high priest, and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests, and gave Abel also to them which were with him. And he said unto them, Now listen to this, because you see, the Sabbatarians do not know this. They do not understand this, okay? The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Amen. Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Amen. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Right. And see, here's, here's the problem that we have with people today. <coughs> they often want to uh, worship or commemorate the day and not the event. You see, you know, you have people, some people get all upset, like I said before. You know, we have people leave the church because we, we say happy birthday. They don't, they don't like it that we even acknowledge having a birthday, okay? And there are those that get all upset and twisted out because uh, we commemorate Christmas on December 25th. They get, they get all upset about it, okay? And it, it doesn't matter. Look, it doesn't matter if it was December 25th. It doesn't matter if it was November, January. It does not matter. It's the event that matters. The fact that the Christ child was born. That the Savior came into the world. Amen. You see. My wife was born on January 1st. I still love her if she's born on January 2nd. Okay. You see. I don't know how much that would matter to her. Okay. Uh, of course, if she'd been born one day earlier, she'd have been a debt tax deduction, okay, for that whole year, right? Okay, but anyhow, you see, it's not the day, it's not the day, it's the event, right? That's right. And it's the same thing with Resurrection Sunday. It's the same thing with Passover. It's not the fact it's not really the matter, the day. You see, when he gave all of what I just read here to you about the new moons and all of that, he didn't give it to the church. Right. He gave it to Israel. We're not the church. We're not Israel. We are under the new covenant. Right. We are under the spirit of the law. Right. We are not under the letter of the law. Right. <clears throat> and he makes that really clear. And I'm kind of really glad about it. Mm -hmm. So now... You say, well, I don't know, I've still, uh, still a lot of things I'm a little bit confused about. I, I, I don't know if it's right or if it's wrong. What if we go over to uh, Philippians chapter 2? In uh, Philippians chapter 2. Starting with verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And you understand that what does it say in 1 Corinthians chapter 2? It says that we have the mind of Christ, not the mind of the world. We have the mind of Christ. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. That's one of those verses that on all the new age perversions of the Bible, they've changed that. You see what it says here? Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. They changed it. That he didn't consider himself to be equal with God. Who made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Jesus Christ. Which is the name, Jesus, every knee should bow, of the things in heaven and the things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. <clears throat> Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. See, that's one of those verses that 
that the opposition, the preterists try to use, and others says that we can, we can lose our salvation. Wrong. <clears throat> what is he telling you to work out? Wrong salvation. He's telling you to work out your salvation. You can't work it out if you don't have it, right? Right. You ever work on something you didn't have? Okay, there you go. Uh, for it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do, of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. There may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as the lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. And so we can have, if we are smart enough, uh, every confidence uh, that our life won't be in vain if we put God first and fervently study his word. And I wanted to go over to 1 <coughs> John. In the 1 John chapter 2, Starting in, in verse 1. That's wrong. Wrong passage. My little children, these things I write unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is a propitiation for our sins. Not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word advocate there. The word advocate, paraclete, means one called <coughs> alongside. One called alongside. Do you understand what we do? Now, today we call those in the courtrooms, we call them lawyers, okay? And uh, <coughs> sometimes they're called public pretenders, okay? Out there we have, we have a lot of those, that, but they're called lawyers today. Now, just imagine this. We as Christians, every one of us, uh, our advocate and our lawyer, if you will, is also the judge. Now listen, see, when you're in court and the judge is on your side, you're going to have a good day. You're going to have a real good day, okay? And that's the way it breaks out here. And he says, and he is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Propitiation means what? That is the payment in full. He has paid in full, paid the price in full. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But who also keepeth his word? In him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. He that saith, he abideth in him on himself also to walk, even as we walked. Well, here now, we have to, to remember, okay, again, we are not the nation of Israel. We are the church glorious. Amen. Uh, there are many, many people out there that, that want us to go through the tribulation. They want to put the church through the tribulation. Uh, the tribulation is very specific in what uh, the purpose of the tribulation is. The purpose of the tribulation is twofold. To what? Purify the nation of Israel, okay, the wife of God, and to do what? Bring judgment upon the unsaved Gentile nations. That's what the, the purpose is. And so what would the purpose of, of having the church, why would the church purpose of being, but yet there are those there. Now it's an interesting thing, and, and this is, the Bible teaches this, that the Lord returns for those that are looking for his return. Right. And the Lord, now, uh, I'm thinking out there that you have these, some of these survivalists uh, that want to go through the tribulation just to practice their survival methods. I don't know. Uh, it sounds a little strange, folks. Uh, uh, what they call them preppers or not. Uh, look, now, you have to understand something else. 
There is a big, 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 big difference between going through the tribulation period and being persecuted by the world. Right. The church will be, the church is now, more than it's ever been suffering persecution on a worldwide scale. Right. And does the, and I'm going to tell you, it's coming our way. Yep. It is coming our way. Time to fight. And so those survivalists, those preppers are going to have plenty of time to practice that because it's coming for us. And uh, you got you got to give them all the credit in the world that they were prepared, that they know enough to be prepared. And uh, this is, you know, we all should be prepared. Right. Okay. And the number one thing that we have, the Bible says, what, one can chase a thousand and two ten thousand. We need to be bound together. Yes. We need to be bound together. Amen. We need to, number one, be able to communicate in, in hard times and bad times. These times are, are coming. They're, they're here. Uh, they're approaching. We're seeing our nation <coughs> divided. Um, the last time it was this divided, we called it a civil war. And we're there now today, aren't we? And so uh, we want to praise the good Lord. Now, we do have some things, a lot of things uh, that God has given us, what, what the world often has meant for wickedness and evil. And one of them is uh, that, that Internet and that computer system. Okay. The world has meant it for evil. But, you know, because Dan right here is so talented, and he's computer literate, so computer smart, uh, he, he comes in and helps me at the studio and uh, brings st things to me that I can see right there. The and I need it. I need that. Okay, so Dan does an excellent job there. Yeah. We need to. We need to be, in all of these ways, uh, is, uh, well, prepared. Okay. And we all have different talents. So we want to just praise the good Lord. In fact, we need younger folks in here. We need more of them also. And then they need the younger people because of what the world has done to them. And what the world is turning out. Uh, it's really pitiful what the universities are turning on today, the colleges. And what they've done to the young people. How they, uh, they, have, they have dumbed them down so terribly. And so they need us older people to give them the reality, you know, especially when, when it comes to history. Uh, you get, and, and I praise the good Lord for homeschoolers for that because they don't get revisionist history. They're getting the, the actual history, things that we've lived. You know, when, when they're telling you these things, and especially now when these young people are telling you about communism. Like I had a young fellow tell me he was going to vote for Bernie Sanders because Communism has never been given a fair chance. Mm. Well, many people will say, look, no, it's been given a very fair chance. It failed in Russia. It failed uh, in Poland. It failed in China. All these countries have failed. But they're wrong. It didn't fail. It did exactly what it was designed to do. And, and you had... Uh, one of the things that uh, Marco Rubio did, if you, if you noticed, he got accused of repeating himself. But he said over and over, four times he said in one debate, uh, he said that Obama is not incompetent. He knows exactly what he's doing. Obama is not incompetent. You had all of these people out there saying, O'Reilly and others, uh, even Limbaugh, this guy is so incompetent, this guy... Uh, he's not, no, he knows exactly what he's doing. And in a sense, uh, he's the best leader that the communists and the Muslims ever had. But, you know, what do we, how do we start off today? Hosea 4 6. My people are destroyed for. Not because the knowledge wasn't presented and given to them, but they rejected it. And with that, we're running out of time. Or today. So, we've been coming to you today from Doers of the Word Baptist Church. And uh, you're listening to us this morning on the Liberty Works Radio Network. That's 
104.3 FM. That is the Eagle in Tampa and Ocala. And uh, you can go to our website, uh, which is wrwl.org. Our email is wrwlministries at gmail.com. That's wrwlministries at gmail.com. Our address is Stewards of the Word Baptist Church, 14781 Sperry Road, Newberry, Ohio, 44065. This radio station you're listening to us on, you can listen to us at 2 a.m., 8 a.m., 3 p.m., and 8 p.m. Eastern Times. And until next week, and our phone number, would you like to call, is 440-338-1367 or 440-338-1036. Until next week, we want to say good morning, God bless, but remember always, always, keep fighting the fight.